Okay. We'll go through Ecclesiastics chapter 1 through 3. So we'll do quite a bit of reading. I'm just going to touch a little bit in the, in the beginning as an introduction, just so we get an idea what the book's about, and then kind of read through it, because it's pretty mundane as we read through it. And that's his whole point in, in writing it. But let me say this. A life that lives in the natural, a life that lives in the natural, will always have a hopeless view. Will always have a hopeless view. If you live in the natural plane, eventually the natural plane will bring you down. Your view of the world, your view of the, your own work, your view of life will always be hopeless because there is no hope in the natural. There is no hope in the flesh. There is no hope in ourselves. We have no ability to do anything. Well, wait a minute, though. But the world does. Are you sure? Well, there's rich people, aren't they? Yeah, but they're hopeless. It's only temporal. It's not going to last forever. You know, they may prosper right now. And who knows what happens in a year or two. They may lose it all. And even at that, if they keep it, they're going to stand before God. And guess what? It's pretty hopeless without God. And so in the natural... It always leads to a hopeless view, and, and that's important underlying view, because how we view life, how we view situations is very important. We really need to get into the spiritual, and we'll talk about that. The book of Ecclesiastics contains proverbs, maxims, which are expressions of general truths, sayings, and is largely a autobiography story about Solomon and how he viewed life. Now, understand as we get through through, through this book, you have to view from Solomon's eyes. He's at the end of his life, and the way that he's viewing life is, is really natural. And so as we, as we study this book, you have to actually understand Scripture, have read through Scripture, and I encourage you to continue to read through Scripture, so that you know truth. And when you read this book, you'll see where he errs in his thought. Uh, when he has an idea, whether it's philosophy, whether it's education, or, or whether it's his view on, on nature itself, you'll see that he's thinking on the natural plane, and that's why his thoughts are off. They're not correct. Uh, they don't make any sense scripturally and according to truth. And I love that about the Bible because that's one evidence for myself that I know the Bible is the Word of God, is that it doesn't try to candy coat things, you know? If you were to, to write a book about yourself, you would probably tell all the good stories, right? You you tell all the good things you did. You wouldn't talk about your problems. You wouldn't talk about your sins. You wouldn't talk about those things that make you look bad. You want to look good when you're writing a story. Well, in God's Word, it's interesting that He just tells history. He, he just reveals it the way it is. You know, you look at some of the kings and you go, wow. You would think if, if man wrote this book, they would kind of cover uh, the heirs of the kings. In fact, when you do look at history, like the Egyptian history, and you look at the pharaohs of history, you don't find anything negative written about them. Do you know why? Because the king said, don't write anything negative about me. Only write my victories. Only write about my successes. Everything else you leave out of history. And that's the way they wanted to be perceived as. And God doesn't do that. He reveals who we are. That is sinners. You know, even the kings and the false. So the word of God is, is really a history of events and stories and prophetic words and truths. And he just tells it like it is. He doesn't hold anything back. And so as we go through this book, you'll find that to be true from Solomon's perspective. So it might be a little hard to pick out what is right and wrong. That's why it's so important to understand the rest of the scripture so that you know what is right and wrong and what is truth. Solomon wrote this uh, late in his life, as I said earlier, probably around 935 B.C., before Christ. J. Vernon McGee said, as the book of Proverbs reveals Solomon's wisdom, the book of Ecclesiastic reveals his foolishness. You have the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters, full of wisdom, and then you have Ecclesiastics full of foolishness because of his perspective in this latter part of life. He had become aware of his mistakes and he began to jot them down as questions 
in the book of Ecclesiastics. This book is written by a natural man and not a spiritual man or from a spiritual perspective, but a natural man trying to find the meaning of life. The purpose of Ecclesiastics is to spare future generations the suffering and misery of seeking after foolish things, meaningless things, materialistic emptiness, and, and offer wisdom by discovering the truth in seeking God and His Word. For us, that is the lesson, is to learn from Solomon's mistakes, and we'll see them as we go through them, and you're going to go, wow, because that's how I think, and I need to get rid of that. I need to toss it aside. And so it's a challenge today for all of us to say, I need to change. And there's some areas that I have to change and I should change. You know, the older that I get, the more that I realize that there are just things that doesn't matter. They just doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. Not, they don't matter to me as much as when I was younger. I wish I had that wisdom when I was younger that I do now. But I don't. And I've learned and I've changed in those times. And there's a time to change. And now's the time for us to look at our lives and to change some things about our lives. It's okay to ask that because change is always happening. We're always changing. We're always growing. Those of you that are young, you're going to get old. Those of us that are old, we're going to be put in the ground. And so the cycle will continue to go on. And so it's important that we change as that cycle goes on. Uh, Solomon's purpose is to... is. It appears that Solomon once again wants to teach, again, his readers wisdom. As he says in chapter 1, verse 13, I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. I mean, he literally looks at every aspect of life in this book from every perspective. Being the billionaire that he was, he had all the resources to spend uh, on whatever it is that he needed to do research on. And that was even on pleasure itself. And he did a lot of research in order to find wisdom. Let me break up these chapters for you just to give you an idea of what we'll be going through. Chapters 1 and 2 deal with Solomon's personal experience throughout life. So he'll, he's going to share from his own experiences and what he has learned. It, it, it's interesting because Solomon literally tests his ideas to see if they'll work or if they'll fail. And I find that interesting because I have done that. I have, I have done tests to see if God is faithful or to see if God um, isn't faithful. I have done tests to see if his word works or if, if his word doesn't work. I'm not going to tell you where the tests are at because you're going to say, wait a minute, are you testing us? No, it's not you. But I have literally done things specifically to see what happens, you know, because I want to know. And that's probably foolishness on my part, you know. And yet I've done things the right way, according to the scriptures, to see what happens. You know, and I found that God's way always works out the best. It really does. And when we think we have the way, if we think that we can do it without God, and we can try it just to see what happens, well, what, what, is God's grace there? I mean, how far can I go to that line? Can I just jump a foot over? And will God have grace at that point? You know, I don't know if you've ever thought like that or even done that, but I have. And I found that that, that is a harder way to go than by just following the Word of God. He describes everything that he sought with selfish pleasure and eventually realized that it was nothing in emptiness. In chapters 3 through 5, Solomon gives a common explanation and observation. One in particular is in chapter 5, verse 15, as he comes uh, naked from his mother's womb, so he will return, speaking of anyone who dies takes nothing with him. And, and that makes sense, at least to us, and that's true. As, as Job said, you know, naked we came into the world, naked we shall return to the dust, so... So there are truths in this, in this book, too, that we need to bring out and understand, and some profound ones, too, and we'll see one tonight. Chapters 6 through 8, Solomon gives advice for having a meaningful life. Uh, 7.13, consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? Yeah, only God can do that, right? We have been so crooked and bent, have we, in life? And it was God who straightened us out. No one else. Boy, my life was so crooked. I was going in every direction uh, that I could think of that would bring me pleasure. 
that would bring me happiness. Whether it was alcohol, whether it was women, whether it was drugs, you know, whether it was control, all of those things that brought me pleasure. And yet God, having grace and having so much love, decided to interrupt my life and say, I'm going to take what is so bent out of whack and I'm going to straighten it out. And boy, he, he knows how to do that if we're willing to humble ourselves before Him. And then chapters 9 through 12 to end the book, Solomon writes a conclusion that clears up the entire book. And everyone eventually dies, and all the deeds of man are vanity, unless without God, or useless without God. Without God, life is useless. And so we need God in our life. Have you ever asked yourself, why am I going through the things that I'm going through? Why is it that I struggle so much? Why do I get depressed? Why is it that I seem to be hopeless? Why do I feel like everything is mundane? Like it's just day after day, same thing, over and over and over and over. If you feel that way, this word is for you. And so let's look at chapter 1 as he describes vanity of vanities. Verse 1 the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Now, the word preacher there in the Hebrew is probably not a great interpretation of the Hebrew word. A better word that would probably be used here would be debater. He was more of a debater and not a preacher. So he's debating these philosophies, these these this education that he's seeking after, this pleasures that he's seeking after, he's debating on whether they're true or not true. And of course, he's the son of David. Now, we know David to be the king of Israel. Now, we know David's life. We know that he had a hard life. We know that God anointed him to be king of Israel and that there was so much opposition against that, not only before, but even after by his own, his own sons. We know Solomon came from Bathsheba, who was the, the second child uh, of Bathsheba. And Solomon literally grew up as the son of David, watching everything that happened to David. Now, keep that in mind. I mean, he saw his father go through all those things. He saw his father make bad decisions. He saw his father uh, being attacked by his brothers. He saw his father running. He saw his father's life in danger. He saw his father at end of life. He saw his father's desire in his heart for the kingdom of God, to build the temple. I mean, Solomon saw all this. And I really believe that Solomon wanted to please his father and fulfill his father's dream. And that's why Solomon ended up building the temple himself. Of course, God didn't allow David to. Why? Because he was a man of bloody hands, right? And so Solomon saw his father uh, make all of these mistakes, and yet he put his father up on that pedestal and wanting to fulfill uh, his dreams to build that temple that God had uh, laid on his heart. And so I believe that Solomon, when he began his reign, he began it asking God, I need wisdom to run your people because my father tried to run your people and it didn't turn out very well. Now he saw everything that took place. And so, Lord, if anything let me ask you for wisdom. And God, you know, um, appreciated that type of prayer. And so he gave him all the wisdom in the world. Now, you would think that having all that wisdom that he had, that he would make some good sound judgments. But at the end of his life, again, he was just a man and he didn't make uh, very good judgments. He multiplied uh, his wealth, gold, silver. Uh, he multiplied his horses. He multiplied his concubines, I mean, concubine after concubine. He, he dove into pleasures of all kinds and sorts and so forth just to figure out the meaning of life. He had so much wisdom, so much understanding that he wanted to understand even that, you know. And so he was confused at the end of his life, which is kind of sad because it gave him the wrong perspective because he was th thinking on the natural plane and not the spiritual plane. And it goes to show you that whether you're King David or whether you're Solomon, you're human. And we all sin and fall short of God's glory. And none of us are perfect. And all of us will be making a lot of mistakes. Uh, you've made some mistakes today. 
And it's not going to stop. Tomorrow you'll make some more, and the next week you'll make more, and throughout the year, and who knows down the road how many more mistakes that you'll make. I mean, it's just life, and it's learning, and it's changing, and it's growing, and God is just working in your life as He continues to be faithful to do so. So we see the preacher here, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, saying, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? Get that perspective in your thoughts about Solomon. He looks at life and just says, everything is vanity. Vanity, vanity, vanity. And vanity means nothingness in the Hebrew or empty. It's just empty. It doesn't matter. You ever get that perspective? We're just like, it doesn't matter. I do this every day. Every day. Every day. It it doesn't matter anymore to me. It doesn't matter. It's just empty. It's useless. Why do I even continue? And you almost lose hope. And that's what he's doing here. He's losing hope. I mean, what profit does a man if he labors all his life? And at the end of his life, he notices he still has nothing. So why labor? And a lot of people think that way. And so what do they do? They stay home and they sit around and they do nothing I'm not going to have anything when I die anyway, so why do it now? Why not just relax and do nothing? Because everything is vanity. Everything is emptiness. And he viewed life that way. No matter what it was, empty, empty, empty. In your relationships, I keep trying, I keep trying, I keep trying, I keep trying. Empty, 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 empty. Why do I try? Why do I keep doing it? You know, why do I even hope? You know, it's all vanity. It's all going to burn. You know, I, I remember a neighbor, uh, and we all moved into Sky Country area, and everybody started building their houses and their fences and their walls and planters and things. And the neighbor built this nice big barn in the back, and he had all these dreams. And, you know, walk, I w- walked back there, and he showed me where his office would be at. He showed me where all his machines would be at and things like that. And then all of a sudden he gets a divorce and he sells it to somebody else and now it's just sitting there as a storage room. Vanity. It's all vanity. You look at that on the natural plane, you go, what, what use was that? Why even build it? Why did he waste the money? He could have done something else. Gone on a nice vacation before he got divorced. You know, I mean, maybe it would have saved his marriage. You know, it just, it's vanity. It's vanity. You know, and it's crazy when you start thinking about life itself and the things that we do, you know, Um, and that's not just relationships, but our labor, our work, our church. Why do we do this? 20 years of doing this. And there were times where it's like, why am I doing this? It's the same thing over and over and over again. People come in, people go, people come in, people go. We grow, we fall. We grow, we fall. It's like, oh, Lord, it's all vanity. It's all going to just perish. And you can have that negative view of life itself. And that's where his wisdom failed him. His perspective was on the natural and not on the spiritual. And Solomon was searching, in a sense, here. His conclusion in life is that all of it's just vanity. It's just all vanity. Is that true? I'm going to make this clear. Is that true? No. It's not true. Life is not vanity. Life is not empty. Life has meaning. When you live in the natural plane, you're never going to be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied. You buy something, it wears out, and it gets storaged, and then it goes in the trash, and then you go buy something else, and you're thinking that will give you the hope, but then it wears out, and you throw it in the trash. Then you go buy something, and you're always searching, searching, and you realize what a vain thing to have. It's just worthless. It's not going to amount to anything. So you look to fill your life with things, hoping to find some purpose and realizing that really it will never satisfy you. Your wife, your husband will never satisfy you. Never. It is Jesus that satisfies you 110%. He's the only one that can satisfy you. The church will never satisfy you. The leadership will never satisfy you. It is Jesus that satisfies you. When you find the spiritual plane, then life has meaning and fulfillment. Fulfillment. Right? So, you know, you wash dishes. Breakfast. Lunch. Dinner. And you go, okay, so tomorrow I'm going to let the breakfast sit till lunch. Okay, so I don't wash them breakfast. But then I've got to wash them at lunchtime and then dinner time. 
And then the next day, you know what? I do this every single day and I see the same cup every day. It's like, I thought I just put that in the shelf and now it's already back in the sink. And, you know, you can look at that in the natural and go, man, this is vanity. It's vain. I'm just going to leave them there. Why even wash them? People do that because they get tired. Think of the spiritual plane. There's a purpose there, even in washing the dishes that we have. When you understand that there's a purpose behind it, a spiritual purpose that reflects Christ itself and his nature and who he is. Everything that God has created is created by him. He created the whole universe The first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh day he rested. And it was all for a purpose. He worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And the seventh day he rested. And so we're to work and work and work and work and work because there's a purpose behind it. Not washing the dishes, but washing the dishes for your spouse. Whether you're male and you wash them or female, I don't know, in your household. But there's a purpose that you are washing these so that your family can use a clean dish and not get sick and have an ugly dish sitting there. The purpose is they're serving your family. That I am a servant and I'm a servant of God and I am serving Him and I'm not even serving my family, but I'm serving them by serving Him. I'm reflecting His servanthood because God was a servant. He came to serve and not to be served. And so when you change your perspective to a spiritual perspective, then it makes sense. I am fulfilling God's purpose here. I am serving and I'm being a servant just like Jesus was a servant. He washed the feet of his disciples. He gave it as an example. Taking out the trash is a no one. Every day I got to take trash. Every single day. Yeah, on the natural plane, I could see how that gets boring. Like, why do I have to do it? Why can't my brother do it now that he's next in line? It's his turn to do it, you know? But when you realize, again, the servant attitude, you're serving your parents, you're honoring your parents, which is biblical, you're fulfilling scripture and how people view you, that you're a good son, you're a good daughter, and that you're you're very Christian-like, you're very Christian-like in in the things that you do, and you're very loving. These are all things that reflect your creator. There's a spiritual purpose behind everything that we do. And we have to get rid of the natural plane and look at the spiritual plane and the things that we do so that life has meaning and life is full. Because you can look at life and say, this is hopeless, totally hopeless. You know, my hip and any of you that have injuries, uh, there are times I'm like, when is this going to end? When is this going to end? Five years. When is this going to stop? And there are times where I'm like, Lord, just take me home so this is over with. You know, I'm tired of it. I'm useless. And you start thinking of all these negative things that are going, that really aren't going on, but could go on, and you're thinking they will go on. But then when you stop and say, yeah, but Lord, Paul had a thorn in his side, and he served you. Jacob wrestled with God. It wasn't a good thing, but God, you know, touched his hip and so he limped the rest of his life so that God would rule over him. There's spiritual meanings, there's spiritual truths there. And if anything, and I hear it from people it's concerning myself, is even in his injury he still serves the Lord. You know, because he could stop. And that's a good thing. That encourages them, hey, I'm not injured. I should be serving the Lord even more. You know, and I don't even have an injury. You know, so again, it's the spiritual perspective that we have. Life is in vain. Life is not vanity. There's purpose behind it all. There's purpose behind you providing for your family and for the church itself and for those that are in less of a position to provide for themselves. Life's course. Look at verse four. One generation passes away. Look at this perspective. One generation passes away. Another generation comes. But the, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises, sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rose. The wind goes towards the south, turns around to the north. The winds whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All rivers run into the sea and yet the sea is not full to the, to the place from which the rivers came. There they return again. So again, his view, just how things are mundane. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. Back to where it went. The winds come here, they turn around, they go back over there. And every day it's the same thing. You know, but you don't realize, you know, that it's important that the sun comes up, isn't it? We would die if the sun didn't come up on a regular basis. And we would probably be pretty 
pretty uh, bad off if the wind didn't turn and create the oxygen and circulate the atmosphere that's in the earth ozones and things like that, and bringing rain and all those other things that help us to grow food and stuff like that. We don't realize that. And the waters that flow down into the ocean and things like that and evaporate. And that's why the ocean doesn't get full because it eventually a lot of it evaporates. And so again, his, his view. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. Isn't that true? The eye can never see enough. Boy. From a man's perspective, it's like the eye can never see enough. My eye is always wandering. That's why Job just said, I made a covenant with my eye not to even look upon a woman. You know, because the eye is never satisfied. Not, not just lusting, but lusting for even material things. Lusting for wealth. Lusting for things, you know. The eye is never satisfied. Isn't that interesting? You can never satisfy the eye. And that, that's a certain truth there. And he saw that. that. It's hard to satisfy the eye. Try satisfying it. Find something and say, okay, Lord, this is going to be the thing that satisfies my eye. It better be big and it better really be huge because when I see it, I will be satisfied. Guess what? <laughs> Once you see it, you can go, okay, what's the next thing? You know, there's always something else. Uh, we, used to, we used to look at boats because the boys at one time were like, let's get a boat. We can go out into the ocean and go fishing. It's like, and you start looking at small boats, and then you look at bigger boats. And like, wow, okay, that's a nice boat. Then you look at even bigger boats. Oh, that's even better boat. Then you look at even bigger boat. We can live on this boat, you know. And it's like your eye is never satisfied. You just want more and more and more. Hours are spent in front of the television. You know, you have to watch the series. You know, this whole craze on vampires and and these things. It's like it's crazy. Uh, how people are so not satisfied. They see it and they're like, i got to get next week's episode. You know, because they're not satisfied with what they saw. They can't just leave it alone, you know. They just want more and more and more. The music that we have, the same thing with music. I don't, I don't get that. I'm not a musical person. I mean, I've never been, even growing up, all my friends were in all the punk and Metallica and all that. I never liked music. I liked listening to it once in a while. I hear it on the radio. But it wasn't something that I bought all my... You know, LPs, remember the LPs and the little little records and eight tracks. You know, some of you that might remember the eight tracks. I didn't buy, I've never bought one record. I wasn't into music. But for some reason, people are into music. And they've got to have all the latest and greatest. And they're never satisfied. They've got to have it all. There's always something new to see or something new to hear. But it's never enough, he saw. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Is that true? Yes. There's nothing new under the sun. It's interesting how I will read a scripture, and and as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, I see this. It's like, oh, Lord, this is great how I can see this truth. And I start writing it down. And so then I write it down. And then I go back and I, I read McGee's commentaries and some other commentaries. Like, all oh, right, none of them got this. Wow, this is neat. This is like you really spoke to me. And then I go a little further back and go to the 1800s and Spurgeon and one of these guys, you know, one of the uh, Wesleyan brothers. And all of a sudden, one of them sees the same thing. I'm like, ah, oh, I thought I saw it. You know, it's like they saw it, too. You know, nothing's new under the sun. It, 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 nothing has n- been invented that has not been invented already or thought of in any sense. Can you even think of something that's not been invented? You know, in some way or form. You really can't. Now, that's why it's evidence that God exists. Because if God didn't exist, we wouldn't be thinking of a God. Right? Think of the thing that does not exist. You can't think of it because it doesn't exist. So everything you think of exists. It's there. And since God is in our minds in one form or another, there has to be a God because he exists. So even though people search for new things, new sights, new sounds, new realities, all of this stuff, it's nothing new. Nothing new at all. It's just amazing. In the 25 years of knowing the Lord, I've seen the the word of God cycled. Just cycle through the teachers, you know, in different aspects, whether it's prosperity or health, you know, they do that recycle. There's nothing of which it may be said. See, this is new. 
It has already been in ancient times before us, he said. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Um, You won't remember. What happened ten years ago? Do you remember what happened ten years ago? I don't remember. Who won the Super Bowl ten years ago? Anybody remember the Super Bowl? You you sport fanatics. See, we don't remember that stuff. It's all going to be gone. One day, in about a hundred years from now, Mariloma, where was Mariloma? <laughs> no. You go to Israel and there's tells all over the place. Just buried cities and, and places that are just buried by dirt and sands and things like that. Cities that, that have been forgotten. You know, pretty amazing. We were in one, one little city that they literally had buried. And uh, this enemy came in and they literally tore down the place and just brought dirt and threw it all over the whole place. And so we were a part of the excavation, and we were digging underground, and when you go underground, you see all these rooms. They literally found rooms, they found fireplaces and things like this, so they did their cooking, and they, were, they slept and things, and they found hallways into other rooms, and it led all over the place. Pretty amazing, you know, but these are places that people forget, because they've just been buried for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So then he went into philosophy, So he looked at philosophy. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. I agree. God has given us that task, but to seek out his wisdom. Right? To seek out his truth and seek it out according to his word. And Solomon took that and he sought out what wisdom was. And so he's looking at philosophy here. His attempt to reality. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. Can you imagine that? Seen all the works that is done under the sun. This guy had so much money that he was able to look at every person's job in his kingdom. And examine it and study it. You might have been a writer. And so he took time and he watched that guy. How does he write? When does he write? Where did he get his inspiration? What does he write on? What does he use? You know, he just, all of that. You know, just studied everything. All is vanity and grasping for wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. So again, he looked at life itself. And and like Camille Albert, who was a French novelist in 1957, he said, life is a big joke. (laughs) Life is a big joke. Yeah, on the natural plane, life is a big joke. It really is when you when you look at life itself. But on the spiritual plane, there's a purpose behind it. And that's why it's so important that we have a heart for the lost. That's one purpose that we need to have in our hearts. People get saved. They need to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that is a purpose. So everything, everything revolves around that. Your life should revolve around that purpose. You know, worshiping God. Obviously, but the purpose of that is to reflect Christ so that people see that and they want to know Christ too. That's the purpose. See how important it is that we live for Christ? Because people are watching us and they're reading us. Life isn't a big joke. God created us. You were fearfully and wonderfully made, every single one of you. God had a specific task for you to fulfill. Are you fulfilling that task? Solomon's philosophy here was was actually empty in itself. I command I communed with my heart saying, "Look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly." I mean, he literally went out of his way to know madness and folly. That's how much he wanted to know wisdom. This this word, uh, I communed with my heart, basically in the Hebrew is talking about earthly wisdom. I wanted to understand earthly wisdom. I wonder, wanted to understand why people are the way that they are. As we have psychology today, psychiatrists, you know, and they study human behavior. Why do people do that? Why do they people act this way? Why is it when they grow up in this type of society that they end up this way and so forth, you know? And that's what Solomon, he was looking at human behavior. And he realized that all of it was just grasping for win. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Boy, uh, the Lord gave me that scripture years ago, back in 1996. 
um, I had it in my Bible. I was looking at my Bible, and there was a scripture that was given to uh, to me concerning this, um, concerning the church here. That in much wisdom is is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. You know, and it was given at the time, and it was in the sense that as I grow and as the church grows in wisdom and knowledge, and it as it increases. It increases in sorrow, too. So kind of like prepare your heart because sorrow's coming along with it. And that's life. Uh, there are going to be ups, but in those ups, the enemy is ready to attack and there will be downs, too, in life. And there's a purpose behind all that. Okay, let's look at chapter, chapter 2. We will get through this if we're here all night. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The study of pleasure. So he goes on and again, he abandons his study on philosophy and on education. He realized that all of it was vanity. I mean, why know everything in the world when you're going to die anyway? And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't really going to help you much at the end of life. I said in my heart, come now, I test you with myrrh. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was vanity. I said, of laughter, madness, and of myrrh, what does it accomplish? I search in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine, while guiding my heart with wisdom, and how to lay hold of folly, till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their life. In Proverbs chapter 31, he talks about how his mother said, stay away from wine. And here, at the end of his life, he's testing wine. He's testing to see what does it really do and is there any joy, is there any meaning in it at all? What joy can you... It's meaningless. It's useless. It's stupidity. I think anybody that drinks, and, and this is just my opinion right now and I might be offending you, but I think, I think that you're off. You're not getting it. Why are you drinking if you're calling yourself a Christian? Anybody that's a Christian should not be drinking. Well, the Bible doesn't say that you shouldn't drink. No, it doesn't say you should drink. Yeah, Jesus made wine. Yeah, he did make wine. But let's rise above that and what is said there. Jesus did not say to drink. He said to be a light and to be salt. And he said not to stumble people. And when people drink, it's amazing what you will put on Facebook. You guys, not you guys, but there are people that are believers and they're older believers and they're putting on Facebook with their little drinks of, of bourbon and whatever. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? How many people are you stumbling right now because you're, you're letting people know, hey, it's my birthday, you know, and I can have a drink on rocks. You know, it's like, come on, really? I, I think that's selfishness. And, and I think you're misleading people and causing people to stumble. If you want a drink, then do it in your closet and let nobody know and have a drink to put, to put yourself to bed or whatever. But there's no other purpose for it at all. It is vanity to drink. There's no meaning, no purpose. It's not good for you. There's no health. There's no health benefit from it whatsoever, you know, except maybe that it puts you to sleep, you know, as it did for Timothy. Of course, they said that was kind of diluted, you know, because of his illness. But drinking has no health purpose whatsoever. What's the purpose? Well, it makes me feel better. Really? So you need to feel better by a drinking? How about the Lord make you feel better? Yeah, but it makes me happy. Really? Where's your joy in the Lord? That should make you happy. Why do you need a substance? Paul even said, be filled with the Spirit and not be drunk with wine or ex excess of these things. And here Solomon said, I tried wine and I realized it's meaningless. Well, me, I I've tried beer. I've tried alcohol. I've tried every alcohol you can think of. I've tried moonshine. My, my, uh, my dad was an alcoholic, and we used to go to some friends, and they had moonshine. You're talking 200%, 200 proof. That means 100% alcohol. You, you take a little shot of this, and you're going, ugh, because you can't breathe as you're swallowing it. Because there's so much alcohol in it that it, it's, it's suffocating you, and you've got to swallow it to finally breathe. And, and almost instantly, you got a buzz because of this moonshine. Strong stuff. And there was my dad, boom. One after another. And after I had one or two, he said, that's it for you, son. You can't handle your stuff. So let the men be men. I'm like, now I look back and go, really, Dad? <laughs> that's not a man. That's stupidity. It's vanity. It's useless. There's no, that's emptiness. I'm getting harsh on that, am I? That's because I don't see any good in it at all. You know? And I think that we need to see that. He goes on and says, I made my works 
chapter or verse four. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens, orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the the growing trees of the groves. He got into agriculture. He built his house. He, he built his land. He built trees. He started testing plants and seeing if that brought pleasure in various things. That one just relates to me so much. Because I love planting. I love my grass. I love clean. I love this church, how it looks just so clean and everything is so nice and all the straight lines. You know, and I like my house. And now that I can't do as much, you know, I, it, it really bugs me. Because I can't get out there and cut my grass. I can't fertilize my grass. I can't pull weeds. I can't rake up all the stuff in the back. Because I would literally rake up all the dead leaves in the back where the trees are. There would be no fruit on the ground. There's fruit all over the place. Leaves all over the place. Dog poop all over the place. Pigs already eating up all the grass. And I'm just saying this because there's animals now in the house. And animals destroy things. Uh, Wilbur was out in the patio today. And I look out there and his whole face is red. And I'm like, God, you really ate pomegranates, didn't you? I mean, his whole face was red, you know, and he just consumed them. And there's holes in my grass because he's eating the grass, pulling it all out. And I'm looking at it. And this just really ministered to me because I my sons know me. I'm just and when they cut the grass, cut it this way and straight line and don't move from that, you know, and then they miss it. And you'd have a little mohawk like see the mohawk. You you got to bring that wheel on this side by two inches to get, make sure you, you know, I'm just that way with it. Some of you probably see that here at church. <laughs> That's bad. It's vanity. And I realize, you know, seeing how it will now be destroyed, I'm like, it doesn't matter anymore. I don't care. Whatever. You know, I, I'm learning. I'm learning. Solomon realized that even in all of that, it's vanity. I, inquired, I acquired male and female servants. I had servants born in my house. Uh, if you can only imagine, you know, they estimated like 10,000 animals just to feed the servants. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds, flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver, gold, and the special treasures of kings and of the province. I inquired Male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, the mus musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excellent and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And he sought it all. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withheld my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. I mean, he poured everything into his flesh. This is, he's talking about pleasure here. So every form of pleasure that you can imagine, he sought after. And then I looked at all the works of my hand, which my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed, all was vanity and grasping for wind. Uh, there was no profit under the sun. Under the sun. Then I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can a man do who succeeds the king? Only what he has already done. Then I saw the wisdom excel folly as light ex exceeds darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. He realized even having all the money in the world, even having all the wisdom in the world, didn't keep from natural things happening to him. That even though there was a fool and a weak person, a small person, a poor person, life happens to take his toll on him, also took his toll on him too. doesn't change anything. Having riches is not going to make you happier. It's vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is and will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As a fool. Just as the fool dies. Therefore, I hated life because the work that was, under, was done under the sun was distressing to me for all is vanity and grasping for the win. He hated life because of the work. 
You can hate life because of the work. You know, uh, when I worked for Southern California Edison, we're going to go over a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, I, I would listen to all the guys complain. Uh, they were complaining about the money they made. They were complaining about the jobs they do. They complained about the boss they had. They always would complain about those things. Then they go home and they complain to their wives, you know, and they talk together, go out and have a drink together, complain about everything. And um, <clears throat> I would get involved in a lot of things as far as union and so forth because I was a union steward and things like that. And somebody had asked me, they, they said, how do you deal with it at home? I go, at home? I don't even bring it home. I said, this job brings me a paycheck so I could serve the Lord. That's the only reason I'm here. My perspective was God had given me this job to provide for me so I could serve him. And that is all that I look at this job as. Everything else in it is vanity. It doesn't matter. I don't care what's going on. I don't care what people are doing. I don't care about these. You know, even though I tried to help people and be fair and so forth, but yet it didn't matter and I didn't take it home because I was too busy serving the Lord. And that's the perspective we have. Some people look at work and they're like complaining all the time. Thank God you have a job. Because a lot of people don't have jobs today. You know. But you can have that perspective. It's grasping for win, as he said. Verse 18, Then I hated my, all my labor, in which I toiled under the sun, because I, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Isn't that true, though? That's true. <laughs> Think about that. I, I build my poor house, you know, and then I'm going to leave it to someone else. If we outgrow this church, we're going to leave it to someone else. How are they going to treat it? You know, It's like giving your dog to someone Oh, make sure it's going to a good home because I don't want my dog to be mistreated, you know, but you leave it to someone else. Verse 19, and, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will rule over all your labor in which I toil and in which I have shown myself wiser under the sun. This also is vanity. And we know his, his son, Jeroboam, who did a lousy job after he took over, divided the kingdom in half. So he was right on that. Therefore I turned my heart and despised of all the labor in which I toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. And again, you have to look at it as, I'm leaving it for someone else. So it's a testimony. When we, when we left our house in, in Redlands, we rented from this this couple of guys that owned it, we left it better, in better shape than we got it. I mean, we had painted it, we had fixed all the sprinklers, we planted things, we changed linoleum in the kitchen, and just, you know, with their permission and stuff, we left it better. So much so that it was such a witness to them that they actually not only gave us back our last deposit, but even another deposit in a sense. But in other words, what happened was, I said, since we're leaving, just, just let us not pay our rent and, just keep, and then keep our deposit as that rent. And they said, no problem. So when the month was over, they didn't owe us anything. Well, then they paid us a deposit. And I said, what's that for? Your deposit. I go, no, no. Remember, we didn't pay you that month rent? No, no, no. Take it. Because they were so appreciative that we left it in better shape than what we got it. And that's how we should be as believers. There's purpose that because it's a witness to those around us. It's all about being a witness. That's the purpose of getting the gospel out. For what has man for all his labor and for all the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun for all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night, his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment more than I? For God gave, gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to the man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering, collecting, that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Let's finish up in chapter 3. I think you're, you're getting, I hope you're getting the, the point here of Solomon. As he ends his, his life here and his perspective really from a backslidden state. It says, to everything there is a season. Now, when we read this part in the Hebrew, it's almost like a, if you ever heard a Hebrew song, how it's just very, very fast. That's how this is supposed to be sung. 
So in a sense, it's like everything, for everything there's a reason, a, a, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck, a time to plant. You know, so that's how it's supposed to go when, when they were singing it. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stone, a time to gather stone, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak. A time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace. What profit has a worker from that in which he has labored? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. His whole purpose for saying this is that life is mundane, isn't it? There's just a time for everything. But there's some truth in that, isn't there? There's a time to hug. Yeah, there's a time to refrain. There's a time to rejoice and there's a time to weep. That's why we need to accept each other just the way we are in the seasons that we go through in life. The seasons that a young kid goes through. My granddaughter being 14 years old, she's going to be going through some hard times. I know that because I've watched my sons go through it and I've seen other kids go through it. It's a season of growing up with all the hormones and all those things that go on in their bodies and these young, young youth. And it's a season they have to grow up and learn discipline, self-control and all those things. It's a season. And we need to love them through those times and help them and encourage them to get through that stuff. It's a season to get older, right? As you get older, boy, what a season. What a totally different season. Once you hit 50, it's like boom. And then 60, I'm sure, is even different than 50. But it's a whole different season. It's a whole different time. A whole different perspective. And I can't explain it to you until you get there. But there's a time for everything. Life is not boring. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in the hearts, except that no one can find out the work of God, the work of God, the work that God does from beginning to end. I mean, God makes everything beautiful and meaningful. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to go, to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all their labor. It is a gift of God. And that's true. We should enjoy our labor. I know that Whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken away from it. Highlight that. God's love for you is set. You can't add to it and you can't take away from it. His grace for you is set. His righteousness. You know you are righteous before God? No, I don't feel righteous. You can't do anything to make you less righteous. You can't sin a sin that will make you less righteous. You are righteous because of God's righteousness. God's righteousness is that powerful and that great. That's why its glory be belongs to God. And you can't add to your righteousness. No matter what you do and how hard you do it and how many times you do it, you can't add to your righteousness. It's fixed. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken away. I love verse 15. That which, that which is ha has already been... And what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. Now that's an interesting statement. I wanted to spend some time on that. But you know what he's saying? What he's saying there is that I am eternal. God lives outside of our time domain. We're under time because of the gravity and rotation of this earth. We live under rotations and years and seasons and so forth. God is eternity. What was, it's already here. What already here is already past. It's already been. Now get this. Get this. That's why when you go to Thessalonians and the dead in Christ will rise first, it's because we're already there. When you die and you go to heaven, you're in eternity. There is no time. A day is like, a thousand years is like a day, right? And so time does not exist. So when you're in heaven, guess what? The past is already done. The future is already done. You're already there. It's already complete. It's already over. So when you get to heaven, like if you die, like Pastor Chuck died, it's over. Not only is Chuck in heaven, his wife's in heaven, everyone's in heaven. We're all in heaven and we're all at the supper table. We're already seeing the second coming of Christ come. It's already done because there is no time in heaven. That's pretty amazing. 
That's why there is no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, because we're not going to see it. We're already there, and it's already over. But we're here in this time, domain, and, and place, and so we're going through it. And yet it's already done when you get to heaven. Interesting phrase. There is no past, there is no present, there is no future. And that's why God says, I am that I am. I exist. Now that should change your perspective a little bit about life. <laughs> It really should. Moreover, I saw under the sun in the place of judgment, wickedness was there and in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of man, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals. Now, this is where he's wrong. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. That's not true. One thing befalls them, and as one dies, so dies the other. Surely as surely they all have one breath or spirit, man has no advantage over animal. For all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all return to the dust. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men which goes upward and the spirit of the animal which goes down to the earth? So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage, for who can bring him to see what will happen after that. His perspective is wrong there. And he's viewing it from the earthly plane. We're just like animals. We die, we go to the dust, and that's it. So enjoy your work. Have fun while you're at it, because that's it. It's all vanity and so forth. Not a good perspective to have, because we know after life is presence with the Lord, right? Absent from the body is present with the Lord. And so... Here, here's my point, and let me just summarize this as we close tonight. If you want to continue to have a natural perspective, then you're going to, you're going to struggle with the trials and testings in life. They're going to seem mundane, they're going to seem difficult, and you're going to lose hope, and eventually you'll be put up on a shelf. You don't want that. You want to see the spiritual things and how God works. Look through His lenses. Look how he sees and what he's doing and the purpose that he has. Nothing has happened that he did not know about. Or, and I will say, even orchestrated to a certain degree. We have to understand that God is in control of everything. And he moves us around as he sees fit where it will benefit the body of Christ for his glory. And we need to accept that. From the spiritual perspective, the Bible says all things work out together for good. Do you believe that? Do you really? Then live it. Then live it. When you see something that you don't agree with or like, know that it's working out for good. God is going to work it out for good. He's not going to leave it alone. Yeah, but I don't see him working out for good. He, he said he's going to. Just because you don't see it, he's not doing it just for you. He's doing it for his kingdom. No, he's working it out for good. Because he's faithful and he's true to his word. Otherwise, you're like Solomon. Oh, I don't see it working out for good. It's vanity, just like I thought. He's not being faithful to his word. And that's what you're saying. You're calling God a liar. You really are. We need to see from his perspective and how he's working the things out in our lives. Father in heaven.